instead of assuming maybe the way it was a few years ago that you could just slap a few ads in front of them and get them to click is no longer true. Because one, you probably won't be able to target the people you want as well. And two, they're not gonna click. And three, the cost of getting to those people has skyrocketed. So again, the patient's virtue kicks in, which is instead of just trying to sort of rank a bunch of ads in front of people, how do you consistently and increasingly authentically show up in front of customers in a way that they feel good about? Welcome to the Backcountry Marketing Podcast. Today, I'm sitting down with Jordan Williams. He has held a variety of director of marketing roles in the industry since 2001. Jordan, you've been at REI, Vail Resorts, Smart Wool, and Red Bull over that time. Uh, quite the career, and I'm excited to have you on the show. Good to see you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Where are you calling in from? Uh, I am here in sunny Boulder, Colorado. Yeah, I lived here about a decade. You aren't buried in snow yet? We are not. The 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 funny El Nino forecast suggests that we in Boulder might end up getting more snow than some of the mountains in Colorado based on the southern trajectory of of all that. We get those nice wraparound storms that come through the southern Rockies. So we'll we'll see. It's supposed to be a bit epic in town, but Well, I'm excited for our conversation today, Jordan. It was a pleasure to connect with you earlier and just learn a little bit more about your history and and some of your ideas and some of your perspective and kind of give folks an idea. We're going to be talking about patience. We're going to be talking about patience in a variety of respects, but we're going to be talking about playing the long game, the value of patience when it comes to marketing. And to, to kick us off, Jordan, I've got a question. As you look at the landscape today and as you consider patience amongst all of the change and disruption that is happening in the marketing world. Why is this a virtue that you think is important? Can you kind of give us an opening statement for for this conversation? I think broadly, my my sense that patience is a virtue is is really born out of this sense that the the marketing industry, the advertising industry following the internet revolution um, went through a phase where there there were truly radical changes in the landscape. And there was an ability to target audiences in a way that had never occurred. And and many of those persist and they're great tools in the toolkit. But I think the premise I have is sort of built off two ideas. One is the sort of digital marketing industrial complex was never as fantastic as the providers might have wanted us to believe to begin with. And two is, I think in many ways, the honeymoon is is ending or has ended, um, whether that is Apple introducing privacy um, controls and sort of privacy uh, elements into iOS 14 a couple of years ago, uh, whether it's just a broad consumer understanding of uh, not wanting to be tracked and therefore sort of using tools, especially from Apple um, that provide that, um, or government, uh, overreach, which is sort of warming up concerns about TikTok and Chinese ownership and what's happening with data. Um, certainly in Europe, uh, there's a much stricter control set over the digital domain. California leads the way in the U S so all of that in various ways, um, combines to the fact that I, I think we're at a point where Absolutely, digital tools are still the bedrock of what we're using to manage marketing and advertising, and customer targeting and segmentation and all of that. But interestingly, there there's a bunch of ways in which kind of old-fashioned, old-school strategies and tactics are returning as really interesting ones to reach for for brands because they're able to connect and reach audiences in a way that are meaningful or powerful um, and work in the evolving digital landscape. You said old school marketing tactics. Old you school mean, marketing. You, uh, you, immediately, I'm thinking of uh, direct to mail and billboards. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the, the irony is uh, the, the number of direct to consumer brands that have really built their businesses on things like catalog. You think about Steo, Faraday, Marine Lair, uh, Viore, where super smart digital first brands um, with amazing websites and digital user experiences, uh, you know, email segmentation, targeting all that. However, investing a ton of money into direct mail and catalog and catalog is not a cheap date. Um, but 
you're able to build an audience, build a customer base, get first purchase, then run retention tactics. And then on top of that, many of those same brands are moving into standalone brick and mortar retail, which if you really want to get into it is like the oldest of old school tactics. Um, and we've seen that across the board from, you know, the internet pure plays of the Warby Parkers, um, you know, Sonos, I think is open retail. There's, there's a bunch of different companies that are choosing to, uh, leverage what a really high cost, um, uh, not only high cost, but, but you have to, you know, if you're signing retail leases, you're signing three at best case, five to 10 year, more likely in commercial settings. Catalog is a program that's probably not going to ROI for two, probably three years at best. So a lot of these companies are leaning on tactics that not only are old school, but are really require, they really require a commitment. You can't just test it for a quarter, test it for a season and bail if it doesn't work. Um, which again, plays back into this sort of patience as a virtue premise that I've been pondering a lot of late. So let's let's pause and back up a little bit before yeah. we continue. You've been at REI, Vail, Smartwool, Red Bull over your career. Can you kind of give us the brief highlight reel, uh, the brief history? The the really short short version is uh, I, I actually have a degree in theater from NYU. So I came out of school being trained as a director and I'm an art school kid, a creative kid. It turns out, and I can take no credit for this, training as a director was really helpful for marketing. You're basically, I'm trained in the, the conservatory practice of working with a bunch of specialists to tell stories. In theater, you're working with actors, set designers, playwrights, etc. In marketing, you're working with copywriters, graphic designers, interaction designers, media planners, etc. So... I came out of that, had a, a, an early part of my career doing corporate event marketing. That led to Red Bull, um, where I got to be a national event marketing manager there in the early days of, of Red Bull's existence in North America and got to do so much of the crazy, wild Red Bull stuff. Uh, produced a wakeboard contest and a flooded lead mine underground in Missouri. Uh, paragliding and skydiving event in Chicago. Got to be a part of the first two Red Bull Rampage events down in, in Virgin in Utah. Uh, and then got to produce the first six uh, Flugtog events, those crazy flying machine events they do, which I always argue is like the most highly budgeted performance art on the planet. <laughs> um, met my now wife. We went and traveled for a little while, came back, got a job at REI. Uh, ran their traditional marketing team. Uh advertising, seasonal planning, all of the sort of long range planning, uh, to set up things like direct mail, retail marketing, new store openings, um, as well as a bunch of really cool sort of things in the portfolio are responsible for marketing outdoor school, REI adventures, membership in the co-op, the REI visa card program. If anybody would like to know about visa card and loyalty programs, let me know. Um, but it was that experience was fantastic because it was really like Red Bull was like getting a, an MBA in alternative guerrilla new school marketing. And REI was very much about old school, traditional, uh, steady as she goes marketing. The, the most exciting thing I got to do at REI was, um, and this is going to start uh, dating me. Uh, when I was there, there was this super interesting thing happening in the landscape. This, this company out of Boston called Facebook was starting to become a thing that maybe brands might want to play with. Um, there was this thing called Twitter that had started. YouTube was a thing. And so I pitched putting together a team we ended up calling the Digital Engagement Team. Um, and it was this small, scrappy internal team that got to do a bunch of really fun stuff. Um, we founded REI's social media practice, claimed all of those handles uh, originally, uh, converted a lot of the long form written expert advice content they were doing and started adding YouTube, um, elements to that. But yeah, it was really fun. It was, it was fun to get to work at REI in a way that was helping bring the co-op into the future. From there, got a job. Uh, my wife and I were interested in maybe moving from Seattle. Um, so got a job, uh, as the director of marketing Keystone, um, one of Vale Resorts properties up in Summit County. We lived in Breck. Had a great run there, um, amazing place to be able to live. Um, helped 
uh, rebrand platform Keystone Resort and bring it back to a lot of its family roots and its focus on destination visitation. So got an opportunity to move down to Boulder and lead marketing and sales for Vail Resorts Retail. Um, from there, uh, went to work for my wife. Uh, she's an incredibly talented interior designer. Um, so we decided I would take a break from the corporate world, become the default parent, um, and be the CEO of her interior design firm. Um, and that led me to return to the corporate world where I was a uh, global marketing director at SmartWall for um, just under two years. So you mentioned that you, at, at, during your time at REI, it was, was when Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and all these social platforms were starting. And that kind of brought in this golden age of, of digital media. And I'm curious if you can kind of paint us the picture of from that point up until what, iOS 14.5, it was this amazing period where there's a whole bunch of opportunity. Can you kind of describe what that looked like and then what changed? And there were a number of things that changed, but it seems like iOS 14 really was kind of the catalyst that prompted a lot of the change that we saw in the digital ad world. And it was an amazing evolution to be a part of because I'll share this. When I was at REI, I was working with our in-house counsel, legal counsel, because we were trying to figure out how do you do this? We were bringing online community features on REI.com for the first time outside of just product reviews. This wonderful woman, Jolene, that I was working with in, uh, in our counsel's office, we brought an outside counsel and I would sit in these meetings with these brilliant attorneys from uh, Perkins QE, with a, one of the leading now Silicon Valley uh, tech firm, tech law firms on the planet and having conversations where attorneys were saying, there's no law for this. There's no case law. There's no precedent. We don't know how this works. Um, was sort of highlighting the fact that like, oh, this is really interesting terrain that no one at a brand level, at a corporate level has really played with. And in fact, from a tool set, most of the platforms were not built for brand corporate users. You know, Facebook obviously came from Harvard where it was this sort of social on-campus network. Twitter was this microblogging platform that had spun out of, I think I'm remembering, a, they were trying to build a podcasting platform at the time. Hmm. It was an offshoot of another business. But none of, the, none of them had tools to allow brands to manage presences, only individuals. So we spent a lot of time kludging together ways to do that. We were early movers on social media management tools. Hootsuite had just launched uh, when we were in the middle of this. So it was wild to go from sort of the very Wild West beginning days where there there was no precedence for how this should work. There wasn't ways in which they were planned for corporate. And then you move through that sort of golden age where clearly companies focused on revenue, um, profitability, cottoned very quickly to the fact that like, oh, advertisers are where we're going to be gaining our revenue. Um and therefore building everything we can to service them, whether it's social media managers, app brands, advertisers, advertising management, integrations into third party platforms um, to allow, you know, audience targeting, data, analytics, all that. So there there was this sort of golden era, this honeymoon where things got really sophisticated uh, over the course of, you know, five years. And that felt amazing. Um, and, and I once in that period heard, uh, unfortunately I'm not going to be able to cite who this was, but somebody coined the term trying to create customer experiences in the digital realm that were spooky, not creepy. Um, yeah. which I think sort of is my title for that ethos, right? It's the, how do you create a way where you're putting your message or your product or whatever you want to get in front of a customer in a way in which they subconsciously even think, wow, that's interesting. I was thinking about getting a new ski shell this winter, or I was thinking about taking a trip and funny, the Keystone is now showing up um, rather than the creepy experience that I think we all urban myth or not have had of having a conversation, you know, about, car insurance or something with a friend or your spouse and suddenly you start seeing progressive ads on Instagram and you're like, Hey Siri, is my microphone on? Like what's, and uh, so, so yeah, there, there was a moment where the ability to target, uh, was extraordinary. Additionally, what I'll offer is, is as a marketer, 
I experienced definitely some moral and ethical moments uh, in the midst of this that were interesting, which is, you know, using Facebook as an example, now Meta, there were moments where the ability to target um, audience facets that felt problematic at a societal level. You know, there was moments when you could target by income, household net worth, uh, race, religion, like all of these things that, you know, I think we collectively have come to understand can be abused incredibly or largely corrosive to society. Um, and we've seen largely by, by political advertisers were exploited significantly to drive, um, problematic campaigns, I would argue. Um, and then I think with the with the arrival and the advent of iOS 14.5, um, Google announcing the cookie-less future uh, and then postponing that kind of <laughs> to this day, um, things started changing and there was sort of an awareness that we needed to start thinking more about first-party data, zero-party data, really how do we use the information that we as a brand or an entity might own about uh a customer and own in a way that that customer has explicitly said, you can have my email or you can have my cell phone for SMS. I would like to hear from you. Um, really started emerging as the, the, the vital part of uh, that customer relationship management rather than relying on ad platforms, social media platforms, et cetera. I would encourage everybody to to Google if they want. Um, uh, there's an essay written uh, called "The End Shitification of Platforms," uh, and and the premise is uh, when many platforms start, whether that's social media, Amazon is another often used example. In the early days, they are incredibly user centric. It is awesome to be a user of them because everybody at that company is designing that platform to be as usable, friendly, awesome. It's improving all the time because the only thing they care about in the early stages, based on how we typically are running and have run largely venture-backed platforms in the marketing and ad and social media space, e-commerce space as well, is in the early days, all they care about is user growth, revenue and profit can come later. So part one of the story of the end shitification of platforms is early days, it's awesome to be a user. In the sort of middle of the story, uh, they start having to strike a balance where like, hey, we need revenue, um, you know, revenue per user, profitability is starting to become a requirement. Either we've matured, we've gone public, we need another round of funding where maybe people need more than just user growth. And so they hit the sweet spot where many of the platforms are really balancing ad placement, user experience, that sort of thing. And then the last stage, uh, as the author describes, the end shitification of these platforms, which I think we can all have sort of our own experience with, Amazon is the one that jumps to mind the most, is the draw, the lure, the inescapable gravitational pull of milking as much money out of the platform you have built as possible becomes the inescapable force. And what happens at that point um, is, you know, if you're meta, you start putting ads everywhere and you start getting more comfortable with, you know, ads, you know, all over Facebook, more ads in the feed, um, switching up, uh, you know, an Instagram feed from being chronological to being sort of what you might be interested in, which is also an easier way to slip in a bunch of promotional stuff that might feel a little less intrusive if it weren't interrupting all of your friends. Um, YouTube starts laying, you know, you've got an ad below the video, overlaying the video at the end of the video. And Amazon, I think, is the one that most people might feel on a day to day, which is it used to be you go to Amazon, you search for the thing you're looking for, you get really high quality results, you can filter by maybe customer review, you find what a great product pretty quickly. And now you go to Amazon, you search for what you want, and there might be sponsored, promoted products on the majority of the first three plus pages. And the ability as a consumer to really know is this, did somebody buy this placements? Did they not? 
And if you're selling on Amazon, you you have to pay them advertising dollars at this point. There's this sort of mafia esque you have to pay to play if you're going to make it there. And ultimately, the the point of this is this this journey, this sort of story arc to get back to the sort of Greek three part tale model is many of these platforms that we all loved are kind of falling apart uh, in a way where we as users are increasingly unhappy using them. Um, and I think there's going to be interesting days ahead because currently they're so these, these, you know, whether it's Google, Meta, Amazon, uh, et cetera, are so massive. And there's a whole other topic. Antitrust enforcement in the U.S. has had a fairly distinct perspective on what they should be enforcing. There's been, I would argue, a really stifling of innovation in this digital space. I think that's going to change in the years to come. And I, I'm curious to see what comes next, because I think once you start generating, especially as a public company, the level of revenue and reporting to Wall Street, you can't you know, calls for Mark Zuckerberg to change the algorithm to not, you know, promote engagement or rage engagement is is never going to happen as a public company because that's how you get the clicks and the eyeballs. Um, so that's sort of an addendum to I think the journey we've we've been on across the digital landscape. Well, it seems like it's ripe for disruption. It feels like the big platforms are slow, they're stagnant, and they're bogged down, and that's when something new usually pops up. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, in the, in the downfall of Twitter, there's a bunch of these distributed sort of microblogging platforms that are popping up that are sort of, uh, you know, anybody can establish a server is sort of interesting. They're a little hard to use for the mainstream player. Um, I do think there's a fundamental paradox at play, which is that what brands, what we want is brand safety which requires content moderation. Um, and I think it's been proven at this point that content moderation at scale is arguably impossible to do. Um, right below that, at the very least, incredibly hard to do. Um, and so that's where I think there will be an interesting, you know, is this one of those spaces where AI steps in? And so instead of hiring a bunch of humans, um, who we unfortunately traumatize by having them weed out the horrific stuff that we, as some of us as humans, uh, seem to want to post online. Do we end up using AI to help weed out a lot of that to, to get us back to a place where we can have, um, shared spaces, shared communities, uh, that feel, uh, safe for us as brand marketers. Um, but I agree. I think there's going to be a bunch of interesting stuff coming um, as some of these older platforms get get disintermediated, or if you're Elon Musk, just burn them down, which is a whole other topic. It's a whole other topic. Yeah. So, so 2021, I was 14 and a half comes out. It throws a wrench into many businesses. Uh, marketing efforts. It throws a wrench into you know has significant loss for companies like Facebook. I think I read. The following year, they had a ten billion dollar loss as a direct result of of four, iOS fourteen and a half. Digital ads seems very much like a short term play. You're throwing an ad out there in the hope that someone clicks on it and buys a thing. I'm curious now: Are we seeing a shift because of this? Because of iOS fourteen and a half, are we seeing a shift towards more long term marketing efforts? Now that we've had, you know, what is it, a couple of years to kind of enter into this this post iOS fourteen and a half? Yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately my take is there, I think the smart brands and the smart marketers are finding the right place and the right way to use different tools. Um, obviously, you know, we as marketers on a personal level might be offended or frustrated with the ills of meta. And there are a handful of brands that have said we're leaving Facebook, we're leaving Instagram for moral reasons, for ethical reasons. The catch 22, the sort of Hobbesian bargain that most brands are making is it's still an incredibly powerful platform to connect with consumers, Instagram specifically, YouTube specifically, um, Google for sure. 
So I think it becomes about if you think about whatever journey you're kind of you're trying to create, whether that's um, capturing new consumers, increasing brand awareness, um, increasing loyalty, repeat purchase, whatever whatever the goal you have is, I think what's starting to happen is there's there's a much more thoughtful way in which what are the tools and tactics we want to use at any given part of that journey? Um, and increasingly, uh, an understanding that a lot of the online advertising is really specifically or should be in a perfect world, really focused as much as possible on increasing brand awareness, getting traffic first, first visit to your site, and then through the journey to first purchase. But once you get to first purchase, by and large, to the best of your ability, online advertising falls way down on the list of priorities for, for um, retaining that customer. At that point, it's, it's email, it's SMS, it's direct mail, it's site personalization, um, it's really innovative customer service on Steo, just to give them a shout out, launched a program where they have an SMS marketing uh, program that is run by actual humans, which is a funny thing to say in this day and age. But like if you sign up for their SMS program, they have a human on their team, native English speaker here in the US, who will drop you a text every once in a while and just say, hey, do you need anything? Can I help answer any questions? Um, and it is this sort of customer service-esque version of marketing. They're trying to be helpful. How can I provide value to you? Um, so I think ultimately that's sort of the first part is, is, is how do you use these traditional marketing techniques to win customers and, and then really try and to the best of the ability set aside those tool sets. I also think in addition to that, there is, there's never been a better time to be a storyteller and using um, long form content, um, something that I really appreciated that Red Bull was in many ways a pioneer of, which is what are ostensibly marketing vehicles, marketing tools that are authentically, not underhandedly, but authentically a value add for our target consumer. So if you think about Red Bull Rampage, if you're into mountain biking, watching Red Bull Rampage every year, super fun. You get to watch the most elite free ride mountain bikers on the planet do stuff that is increasingly mind bending. Um, it is an entire Red Bull ad, but I happily watch because it is cool to what I want. Um, it is it is of the things I want to do. If you're, you know, Black Crows or or Marona, and you uh, are into free ride skiing. Uh, I would, I'll watch anything Nico puts out, uh, on his sort of pole star driven Norwegian ski trips. Um, cause it's amazing content. It's like these little, what used to be once a year when I was a kid going to the Warren Miller or TGR or matchstick is now sort of, he's putting out all the time and I'll eat it up. And in doing so, I have a positive sense of, you know, Black Rose, Morena, Polestar, all of his brand partners. So there's ways in which storytelling and brand content as value add for consumers becomes a way in which you can increase brand awareness, increase loyalty, um, increase sort of intent to purchase next time uh, in many ways. And so I think there's sort of multiple levels to, there's the tactical level about how you get to purchase. There's a bigger halo effort of how do you create brand and brand impression and brand awareness and brand loyalty. Um, and then at the end of it, I think it's really about how are you creating authentically meaningful consumer experiences. So if I've shopped on your site before and I show up, especially if I'm logged in, how do you create a site um, that is personalized for me? You're showing me the stuff that I'm interested in. Um, and at a really high end, sophisticated level at REI, they were just starting this, but many brands are doing this. Brands are getting to personalized catalog where they're doing unique print for customer versions of catalogs where, you know, hey, if you're uh, like Cole, you've got a, 
a toddler, you've got an eight month old. So your catalog from REI or backcountry could show you, you know, burly cross country ski, uh, or chariot products, because it's like, Hey, you've got a kid, you're going to be towing around for a little while, whether on the bike, uh, on a run on a cross country ski, let's show you that. But I've got an eight year old or a 10 year old and a 13 year old. Uh, so show me, you know, small mountain bikes that kids might like or family ski products, uh, for teenagers. Um, those are those sorts of things where brands mostly on a subconscious level to most consumers are creating like, Hey, we know you and we want to helpfully give you the version of us that you will be most interested in. Hmm. Um, going back to that, hopefully spooky, not creepy. So you just outlined an entire marketing plan oh God. in about, yeah. in about three minutes, yeah. which is, I, it's fascinating. I love the idea that storytelling is more relevant than ever. That's something that hits home for, for me that I believe. There's a lot here. Yeah. This is this is by no means a short-term game. This is a very long-term forward-thinking plan. Is this all changed? Is this a more patient play than maybe things would have been five or ten years ago in the golden age of of digital ads? Yeah, because I think the... Yes, full stop, yes. The... The sense I have, and again, this is all, obviously, I will copy out all this. This is my worldview. This is what I believe in. Um, but it's what I've experienced and put to use at a bunch of different brands, uh, and it's worked. It, it is a longer-term play. It's a patient play, because I think there was a period when, you know, I, I would sort of describe it to be this sort of period of peak growth hacker uh, period, where, where you could design a product, launch a site, you know, crank out a site on Shopify, um, go in either yourself or hire a really smart uh, campaign manager um, to incredibly nuanced and sophisticated audience targeting, get your product in front of somebody and and sell it um, and and get revenue going. Um, and, and certainly you can still do that to some degree but there were whole companies that could sort of survive and thrive for for some number of years in the sort of peak of this. I think that's increasingly hard. I think it's increasingly hard to differentiate that way. Um, one, based on the change in the digital landscape that we've been talking about. Two, I also think attitudinally, consumers are becoming more jaded. Um, we're becoming a bit more uh, advertising blind to a lot of that. We're willing to just sort of scroll by that in our feed or skip the ad. Um, and, and so the requirement to tell stories, the requirement to build relationships with customers, the requirement to get somebody from not being aware of your brand to aware of your brand, to willing to try your brand, product, service, whatever you offer for the first time, and then try and get them back into a second purchase and a true relationship for especially in the outdoor industry for a lot of the products that most of the brands in the industry sell meaning high cost um maybe seasonal use um because most of the industry is awesomely and correctly focused on quality sustainability durability um, a lot of the products that we as brands in the outdoor industry sell you don't buy that you know, does the average skier or snowboarder, how often are you buying hard goods? How often are you upgrading or swapping out your outerwear for an alpine season? Um, you know, there are things that move faster. Certainly at Smart Wool, you know, if you're a runner, you're going through socks at a higher rate. You know, what, what might work for skincare products or these sort of replenishable items where you're buying them once a month, etc., um, you know, and I was at smart wool, you know, think about if you have high quality merino wool, smart wool base layers, unless you are a crazy aggro 150 day in them a year, most users are only buying those every many years. So all of that is, is background to say it's patient because not only does it take more time to get people into your brands, but if the repeat purchase cycle is longer, your ability to touch consumers is longer. Your ability to build these relationships takes longer. And therefore, from a marketing strategy, 
the sort of storytelling and presence of mind that you have to persist over a longer period is even more important. So here's a follow up to that. Yeah. So you're saying that essentially brands are playing a longer game. They're they're being they're being more patient in building relationships with customers. I also think at the same time, though, if you, if you pulled the average American, people would say, well, consumers and customers and, and society is just less patient these days. So it seems like we have these these two different these two different forces. Individuals sure. are less patient, but brands are potentially or in this example, are, are displaying more patience. Are those at odds with each other or do they actually, do they work well together? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, and it's a challenging one, I think. Um, I think I'll offer a, a couple of different answers and I'll, I'll completely own the fact that this first one is maybe my own optimism. Uh, uh, and sort of the the hope that I'm clinging to in the modern world, I'll say I hope to frame it correctly. But I do see a testament to this. I, I think consumers are coming to understand as we've moved through this crazy disruptive digital age um, where we suddenly have phones in our pocket that are available, supercomputers, 24 hours a day, content is ever-present, um, the TikToks of the world, the Tinders of the world where you can just whip through stuff i believe we will have balancing forces that will self-regulate some of this behavior i think we see some consumers um and people i'll stop talking about them as consumers i think there are people and i'm optimistic an increasing number of people and especially in the outdoor industry that are coming to understand this isn't the, the way we've been living the way the world has been approaching this isn't necessarily that healthy and I think you see different facets of this. I think you see a return, and some of this was accelerated by the pandemic, um, a return to slower interests, right? Sort of baking sourdough, uh, the number of people I know that are knitting things, the number of people that are interested in sort of picking up a hobby that has a certain craft component, whether it's home brewing or building stuff around the house, doing maintenance on their own equipment um, and understanding that sort of a slower picking some moments of slowerness in your life um, is really healthy. Getting outside. Um, I, I had the joy of going on a, a week long backpacking trip down into the Grand Canyon a couple months ago. And, you know, the ability to get off the grid, no cell service, no phone, um, just the Canyon, the river and the stars was a total gift and a remembrance a reminder to me of, of the power that that does. I also think you see it in the way in which the industry and customers and consumers are embracing, you know, kind of old fashioned things, wool. And I know I'm biased because I came from smart wool, but you know, I think there was a period where we were all convinced that, you know, it's that line from the graduate plastics, right. That, that polypro and all of that was going to be the future. And it turns out, you know, merino wool, um, you know, what PACA is doing here in Colorado with alpaca insulation, um, the knowledge that waxed, waxed cottons are actually an interesting material to use in a bunch of different settings. So a bit of a return to sort of what we would have thought of as old fashioned materials as part of this. So I think part one, um, in long winded answer to your question is I, I think consumers are, 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 and we as people are maybe going to self-regulate back to an understanding that slowerness or periods of slowness in our lives are better. I think at the core, your question persists though, which is there is a tension between in the digital landscape, in that fast moving space, how do you get a potential customer's attention? Um, but I would go back to patience, which is Instead of assuming maybe the way it was a few years ago that you could just slap a few ads in front of them and get them to click is no longer true. Because one, you may not target, you probably won't be able to target the people you want as well. And two, they're not going to click. And three, the component we haven't talked about is um, the cost of getting to those people has skyrocketed. 
Um, so as the Googles and Alphabets and Metas of the world have become these revenue driving behemoths and net income driving behemoths, public companies, they have to continue to generate that kind of income for their own success as a public company. So the cost of connecting with consumers has continued to go up in these digital spaces. So again, the patient's virtue kicks in, which is instead of just trying to sort of crank a bunch of ads in front of people, how do you consistently and increasingly authentically show up in front of customers in a way that they feel good about? How do they, how do you as a brand sponsor podcasts that they listen to? Um, when we were at Spartwell, there was a bunch of work we did with NPR actually to help raise brand awareness at a broad level. And NPR is interesting because it's non, you can't be promotional as it's a national public radio. Um, but we found it an incredibly effective and increasingly cost effective way to get our brand out in a space that consumers felt good about and connect our brand with something they liked. Um, so whether that's sponsoring athletes, doing content projects, sponsoring podcasts, um, sponsoring events, um, these ways in which that you can get your brand out there that take longer and are slower and are harder to track um, is still, I think, the way in which you do it authentically, um, even in this really fast-paced world. I don't, I don't remember I heard this, but I think it's a pretty common idea, this idea that there's so much content and so much stuff in the world that chances are we don't, we don't, we don't remember it. But of the things that we do remember, we only remember a tiny, tiny percentage of the stuff that we, you know, because I think well, there's a stat out there that says we, we see and consume like 10,000 ads a day. And how many of those do you remember? None of them. If you're a brand, how do you, how do you help people remember? How do you help people find you in the noise? And what I come back to and in, in what you were referencing is this idea of storytelling. And for me, like that's emotion. It's like, how do you create a feeling? And people remember feelings. People remember how they felt about something. And whether that's through a, you know, a 60 second spot, a feature film, a really well-written article, a beautiful magazine article, like that's the stuff that we remember. Um, and so I, I, I wonder, and I think I hope as well that I think there's going to be this resurgence of trying to create feeling with, with the stuff that we do. I, I couldn't agree more. I was having a conversation with somebody, uh, yesterday. This sounds like you and I synced up and agreed to hit this point, but it was, it was honestly yesterday where they said, what's the one thing a brand should do? And, and I said, create a feeling, um, and, and to be clear, because I think it's worth expounding upon from my perspective, when I say feeling is fundamentally, that's an emotional response we're trying to garner. Now it could be an emotional response connected to your product that the feeling is if I use that product, I will be, you know, at smart will more comfortable when I'm going and doing the things I want. It could be that I will be, you know, uh, I will, I will rip harder on the slopes. I will, I will ride on the trails like the pros. Um, it could be product related. Um, it could be, um, societally related, right? I feel better about buying your product because the way in which this company is working in the world makes me feel better or more hopeful, whether that's, you know, they're operating in a way that makes me feel like my consuming this product is going to have less of a harmful impact. Could be environmentally. I feel better about buying from this company because the way they treat their employees, um, the way in which they make say outdoor spaces safer and more open to people that don't look like you and I, right. Uh, whether that's, uh, you know, people of color, LGBTQ plus, um, but a feeling nonetheless, um, is I think what you're going for. Um, and, and a feeling in its most perfect form, I would argue is you're creating a sense that your, your brand is, uh, a community. It's a tribe. And if you, wear that brand, use those products, you are a member of that tribe, right? And I think the examples that come to mind are 
you know, if, if you wear Patagonia, putting aside the sweater vested VC bros in Silicon Valley, but if you wear Patagonia, there's a, a feeling that many of us have that I, I ascribe to a certain worldview about how corporations should operate. Um, and I'm willing to use my wallet to, to support that. Um, it could be, you know, if you, if you ski on black crows or wear their product, it's sort of like, I am a part of this sort of zany, uh, rad, uh, a, a little bit off the edge, uh, sort of Euro crowd, this sort of all these crows with their personalities. Um, and, and I think it's about feeling like you're connecting to something bigger than you, um, whether that's performance related, impact related. And, and I think if you do that well, people end up having a, an understanding of your brand that they may not be able to articulate. Some of you may have seen this, Cole, you may have seen this, but um, I think it was Seth Gooden who said this recently, but he was using the example of the power of brand. And the example he used was if I told you that Nike was going to be opening some hotels, I think any of us would immediately have our own sense of what that would be like. Now, our sense would always, you know, would be different, but all of us would probably have a pretty good idea about what a Nike hotel would look like. You're like, all right, it's going to have a rad fitness facility. It's going to be colorful. It's going to be sporty. It's going to be kind of young. It's going to be in a cool neighborhood. And then, <laughs> oh, poor Hyatt. The example he used was, if I told you Hyatt is launching a line of footwear, tell me what that's going to be like. And obviously the takeaway is you're like, I have no idea what shoes they would make. <laughs> because, you know, Hyatt is, I would argue, a logo. But doesn't mean anything to any of us. Um, whereas Nike means something to all of us because they've been brilliant at what they've been doing for so long. And obviously at this point, they have all the talent in the world and all the money in the world to go do it. Um, but I think that is sort of an interesting litmus test for, um, you know, an acid test for if, if your brand means something, if, if you introduce something outside of your category, would people have an idea about what that might be like? Hey. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that Brands are tribes, and I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a roundabout story, but it's going to connect. Yeah, so yeah. I was talking to a buddy of mine, Chase White, who's a photographer up in Squamish, and he was on the show a couple of years ago. Phenomenal photographer, great guy. And we were talking about what it's like to to come off of a production and and to re-enter like into, let's say, society, which is an exaggeration. But I was telling him, like, we wrapped up this big shoot over the summer. We were gone for a couple of weeks, and I came and I came home, and I just felt I just, I didn't feel at home. Like I felt slightly like on edge. I felt a little anxious. I didn't feel like I, I, I missed being on set. I missed being in that environment where you're on all the time. You're with this gr close knit group of collaborators. And there was something that I felt like I was lacking as I came home, nothing against being home and my, my son and my wife. But so I was telling him about this and he was saying, you should read this book called tribes. And it's sitting on my bookshelf behind me. And I, I can't remember the author, but the, the, the premise of the book is that back in the early, early days of, of America, there were 13 colonies. There was these events that were happening and that people were trying to explain. And, and, and what would be happening is that white people, Western civilization, would find themselves uh, migrating or merging and, and leaving, leaving civilization to go live with the natives. And the natives would, would never come the other direction and come live in a white colony. And the question was, why is this? Why are white people living with the natives? But the natives aren't coming to live with the white people, generally speaking. And the answer was, well, because they have something that we don't have in our culture and in our society. There's this, there's a literal tribe and it meets all of the requirements that people need. They feel like they belong. They feel like they matter. They feel like they have a meaning. And the book goes on to explain all these different circumstances and all these different examples throughout life where different events lead to this creation of a tribe. You know, they talk about sporting events, they talk about combat and veterans and, and this feeling of not belonging. And it, it made me realize that there's a piece of that that I feel when I'm out on a shoot and then I come back home. There's this disconnection between being in the zone and then coming back and having to readjust to regular life. But I think it all connects to what you're saying about, you know, 
brands are tribes and you feel like you're a part of a tribe. And I think it's that feeling that's sometimes hard to explain and hard to quantify and figure out what am I feeling, but you feel something. I, 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 I yeah, I, I love that story and, and I'll, I'll, I'll match one. Um, I, I'm, I think I said this earlier, our, our daughter's 13 turning 14 next month and she's awesome. Uh, and I don't ascribe to all of the stereotypes uh, that exist out there, fathers and daughters and teenagers and whatever, but some of it is very, very true. And my wife and I read this great book. I think it's called Untangled. I think I'm getting that right. But the author, who's a, a, a childhood psychologist, basically talks about the journey that teenagers are on, and especially middle school girls. And, and what she describes at a psychological level is our daughter and teenagers, middle schoolers, especially girls who, um, I don't understand why there's patriarchy because girls mature so much faster than us boys. Um, and, and the psychological experience that she describes is at this age, your child is needing to separate and disentangle from your family to form their own independence and form their own independent being. But at a biological, instinctual level, we understand as humans, homo sapiens, that there is safety in numbers. And so what they need to do is adopt a new tribe outside of the family. And so she was saying, hey, if your teenage daughter, when they talk about their friends and their friend group and the drama in middle school, and it feels life and death to them, and you don't understand why, understand that psychologically, it is at a base, fundamental, psychological, biological level. It feels life and death to them because they have to lead the family, but they have to adopt this new tribe to stay safe. Um, and so I think it's another example that you're hitting on um, mm. that we as people understand consciously, but especially subconsciously, that belonging to things is important. And I think one of the things that's happening is we as a society, we as parents, we as individuals are increasingly understanding that, um, and, and this is an entirely different podcast, uh, the ways in which society has changed the last uh, decades in the sort of, you know, 60s through now, um, you know, say what you will about religion, but the decline in church participation, the decline in participation in civics organizations, right, Rotary, Shriners, whatever, um, we in many ways have retreated into these digital spaces that suggest that they're social, that suggest that they're online community, but actually aren't. Um, and we are increasingly, uh, isolated and depressed and sad. Um, suicide rates, as we all know, are high. Um, and, and, and I think the outdoor industry specifically has this amazingly powerful healing connecting role that many of us love it's the ability to to do the things we want to do by and large we enjoy doing them together many of the activities we need to do together for safety right climbing backcountry skiing kayaking whatever it is um and the joy of doing it with other people the ability to come back from a day on the hill a river mission whatever it is and feel like i did that with my friends um and therefore, there's this natural ability for brands to understand that connecting in with that um, and authentically um, doing things to to support that. And I think that's where uh, there are these interesting experiences I have as brand marketers, as a brand marketer. Um, and I'll, I'll use some vague examples from, from Smartwool, where as a marketer, it was like, well, we should give money to a bunch of these different organizations. But as a public company, well, there's a difference between marketing dollars and nonprofit donations. And VF does a great job across both. This is not a denigration of them at all. Um, but it is interesting where, as an example, we as a marketing team would have these blurred moments of, well, is that a marketing spend or is that a nonprofit donation? Because we kind of view it as both or the same. And I say that just to illuminate the idea that as a marketer, the idea that that overlap could be a natural outcome of the work we were trying to accomplish is an example of the way in which we're trying to create authentic connection. Um, mm -hmm. You know, 
giving money to groups to get, um, you know, LGBTQ plus outside or supporting the plus size community to feel welcome in the outdoors or these wonderful things long overdue that are happening in the industry at last. Um, it's a blurry line between are you marketing? Are you supporting? And the ultimate outcome is they're both. And that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, I think there is this tribal, this connection that we need as humans, um, which again, I think goes back to the through line we've been talking to, which is you can't create tribe. You can't create connection. You can't create community fast. I mean, when was the last time you outside of maybe being a kid or showing up at college um, or maybe with friends, if you're having babies at the same time, there are only a few moments in life when we actually make friends really quickly. But outside of that, it takes a while to get to know people. And especially as adults, it takes, I would argue, even longer. Um, so that persistent, consistent way in which brands should show up, I think goes back to this sort of patience as a brand marketing virtue. So if you had, let's give you a hypothetical scenario. Let's say you were working on a brand, you had unlimited money and you had <laughs> an unlimited runway. You didn't have to prove a return on anything. And I know this isn't a real world example, but I'm curious. Oh, please how... make it so. I'd love this job. Anybody <laughs> who's got that, go for it. What would you do? Like in, in your in your most creative, your most creative self, uh, what would you do to create a tribe? Oh man, I think the the the, the first element. Um, I'll try answering it this way. I, I think the first element is is you have to know what do you stand for in the world. What what do you care about? Who who do you want to be known as? Right? There's there's a a brand establishing exercise which. There's a bunch of different versions you can play, but it's, you know, if, if your brand were somebody at a party, who would they be at the party, right? Are they the person who sits in the corner who likes to have really deep conversations? Are they the DJ? Uh, do they talk to everybody? Um, if your brand was a music playlist, what kind of music would it be? Um, but I think even more than that, like, what do, what do you as a brand care about? Is there a community that you want to be a part of? Is there a purpose you have? Um, because I think birthing your brand and the stories you want to tell out of a place that is true is the crux of all of this. We have, you know, the landscape is littered from with, with brands where they have ginned up or hired consultants to do a marketplace SWOT analysis um, and, and have sort of come out with, you know, examples. I was looking at one on LinkedIn. Is this yours? Somebody was highlighting a, it was a Toyota ad a few years ago that had a forerunner ostensibly pitching to the mountain bike this, community. This, this might have been, yeah, this might have been us. Yeah, <laughs> of credit due. Um, and it was like the worst Walmart crappy bike with reflectors. I think it had a kickstand. Uh, yep. The person was dressed <laughs> in some combo of sort of a BMX racing outfit or a DH. I mean, everything was wrong. The, 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 you know, the forerunner wasn't dirty. It didn't have a bike rack. You know, none of this was authentic. Um, and, and, you know, I think I also saw a, a Chevron ad the other day pitching how they were great environmental stewards. And you're like, why are you even trying this? Like, and I'm not, you know, I drive a car still that needs petroleum. I fly on planes, uh, when I need to, like, I'm not knocking oil writ large, but so I think part one is, is who are you and, and what are you, where are you from? And then I think it's about what are the best ways in which that community point of connection can be made? And there, there's a whole bunch of examples. I, I don't have any brilliant revolutionary ideas, but there's a whole bunch of examples out there of people doing really interesting things. Um, I was just up in Portland uh, a month ago and I went by the Snow Peak flagship uh, out in the Northwest and they have Tabiki, which is a restaurant. And you're like, you're a camping brand. Why do you have a restaurant? And it's like, well, you can come have dinner basically at our store and the way in which we prepare the food, the way in which we serve the food, the architecture of the restaurant that you sit in, 
are all ways in which we're sharing with you the thing that we care about as a brand. Gathering around fire, right? Talk about tribals going way back, but like sitting around a fire in the preparation of food and sharing that with others is a core expression of what they care about in the world as a brand. And so that crazy notion, you know, if you reach back, uh, you know, there, there have been brands that have done this from a department store perspective from age old, but the idea that like an outdoor brand should open a restaurant, a Japanese outdoor brand should open a restaurant in Portland would be crazy talk. But the fact that they're opening a restaurant, they're opening campgrounds, um, companies are offering adventure travel experiences, uh, sort of guided adventure travel experiences under their brand. Um, so I, I would lean into what are the most perfect ways in which you can share the essence of who you are as a brand. Um, and within that, there's a business premise I've long held to, and this sounds snarky, and it's not. But when you're sitting in a meeting in a brainstorm, and maybe the brainstorm is kind of run dry, or maybe it gets a little tense because you don't feel like you're getting as far as you want. And someone, uh, and I'm, I do this all the time, so this is pointing the finger back at me. When someone throws out the idea that's so ridiculous, mostly to get a laugh and break the tension, I would argue almost 10 times out of 10, that's the best idea that is thrown out in a meeting. That it's so ridiculous and over the top that everybody goes, oh yeah, that would be, that'd be crazy. You're like, yeah. Now take that idea and maybe unpack it and, and strip it back to a place that's a little more real. Um, but that idea is probably the best because it's coming from this maybe uncomfortable place that you had. Um, but that may be the best idea you have, right? It's, uh, and and Red Bull basically built a brand off of think of the craziest possible thing you could do, and they would say yes to it. And you know it helps to be a privately owned entity that's owned and operated by one wildly uh, high net worth individual, uh, Dietrich Mateschitz, rest in peace. Um, and so they had a corporate framework where saying yes to stuff was easy, um, really hard to do if you're a public company, um, uh, harder to do if you're a public company. Um, but those crazy harebrained ideas are often the best idea that people at the company have. Um, so whether that's, you know, working with artists, um, creating experiences, um, because I think going back to the tribe and the example you raised of colonial America, you know, what those tribal experiences were, and again, I'm saying this as a cisgender straight white dude, um, I'll acknowledge all of that, but uh, you know, working as a community to where, where sort of the act of feeding everyone is a communal act, um, the act of sustaining the community, whether that's hunting and gathering, whether that's farming, whether that's raising young are, are these communal experiences. And therefore it makes all the sense in the world that going back to my example, snow peak is offering where you can dine together or you can go camping together. Um, or brands are offering, Hey, you can come climbing with us. You can come skiing with us. Um, I think our, our fundamental ways in which the non-traditional, the long-term, the patient approach is coming to a fore. I don't know if that was a weak answer to your, if you had all the money in the world, but, uh, that's a staunch, <laughs> that's a staunch question. Well, like all questions, the answer is generally, it depends. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, what I love what you said, though, good ideas. I, I heard this recently. It's that hard work only takes you so far. And at some point you cross a threshold where it's no longer just about hard work, but now it becomes about hard work and good ideas. And it's the good ideas that take you to the next level. It's the great ideas that take you to the next level. And that's not a that's not a it's not a reason to say that you still don't have to work hard. But good ideas generally come from come from time. They come from space. They come from making space a priority so that you have time to actually think and brainstorm and come up with ideas. And that comes from, I think, a, the core virtue of patience, which is it's okay if I'm not spending this next hour rushing to get something done. I'm going to take time to actually sit and think and come up with an idea because who knows how far that idea might take you in the long run. 
Um, sure, it's good to be productive for that hour, but if you use that hour brainstorming, you might get way further if if you give yourself that space. Or, and so, or, or even or even more, and and you're a creative. The the advice of go go do nothing, stop thinking about this problem, go for a walk, <laughs> go take a shower actually get your brain completely off of this and what we know and has been proven psychologically is your brain is working in the background subconsciously on finding an answer and often it could be when you're doing the thing that is not directly related to um that problem solving act is when you actually get the answer but i think there's yeah. something about our puritanical calvinistic American must be productive, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, accomplish, accomplish, accomplish brain ethos approach to the world means that if you're not actively working on something, you're lazy. Um, you're not doing hard work, um, as opposed to what we actually understand is true, which is if you're trying to solve a problem, do some research, do the brainstorm, think about it. And then actually like, don't think about it. Go do almost anything else. And in doing anything else and kind of ignoring it actively uh, is when, certainly in the creative field, the artistic field, this is true, but I would also argue at its core, any facet of business is creative. I don't care if you're a merchant, a buyer in finance, we all have problems to solve in the, in the way we work in the world. And those solutions come to us um, often when we take a break. Whether that's like formally like meditating or truly like I'm going to go cook soup for an hour and just think about not burning the onions and the mirepoix and and I'm going to make some soup. But that might be the moment when your brain actually unpacks the answer that you were looking for. Well, Jordan, we're running out of time for today, but if you had to wrap it up for us, we talked about a lot, but there's this through line of patience. If, if you could leave our audience with any final thoughts, what would you want to leave them with? Um, I think the final thought I would offer is, is an, maybe an acknowledgement of reality, which is if you're a marketer, um, if you're a brand leader, you have, you have requirements, you have bosses, you have goals, you have revenue to drive, you have, if you're at a public company, a quarter to hit. So everything I've talked about today is, is comes with the caveat and a deep and empathetic understanding, a reality I live as well, that this is really hard balance and it's a hard pitch sometimes when you want to go get the budget approved for the thing that's harder, or if you want to, um, take a non-conventional approach. Um, and so the, the sort of final thought I'd offer is, um, Use data, use budgetary arguments, um, use case studies to to unpack the fact that um, doing the easy and obvious, uh, what you have been doing, may not be ROIing the way you want it to, or or may not be cost effective in the months or years to come, um, and instead investing in you know, a great customer data warehouse where you can store customer data safely and have zero and first party data and build an amazing email program is a better spend than giving Meta another big check. Um, you know, investing money in not influencers, I would argue, which is a whole other thing in the sort of shallow influencer kind of way, but instead actually creating relationships with people in the community you would love to communicate with and connect with and help them achieve what they want to. Um, again, going back to Red Bull, we would often work with athletes and just say like, what would you do? Like if you could build an event, what would you want the event to be? And that's what we would end up doing, which is why the events were often as meaningful and cool for that community. But I know and want to offer, this is a hard road to hoe sometimes. It is a tough argument to win. It's tough money to get uh, out of the budget. Um, so to the best of your ability, do the hard work to create a business-driven, empirical-driven, when possible, sort of data-framed argument about why this is the right thing to do, or at least the right thing to test. Um, because it can easily come across of, you know, you just want to do the cool 
fluffy thing. I want to go make a movie. I want to sponsor this cool event so I can, you know, go to Jackson in February. And you're like, no, oh, no, this is, there's actual, you know, financially driven, long-term smart strategy. And that's, I would argue the hard work coming up with ideas and figuring out cool stuff to do is in many ways, not the hard work. Um, that's the fun work. It's the work that's sort of around us all the time. But the hard work is how do you actually connect it back to the bottom line um, and win the arguments it takes to to do it. Amazing. Well, Jordan, I really appreciate this conversation. If folks want to connect with you, where can they find you? Yeah, um, I would say uh, LinkedIn is great. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, connect with me there. Send me a message. Happy to chat with anybody. And yeah, that's probably the easiest and fastest way to get to me in this setting. Awesome. Well, Thank you very much. I enjoyed this conversation. I think we've got some potential topics to circle back on and do a part two and a part three. Psychology of now... tribalism and humanity podcast <laughs> coming to you soon. Well, and I think and I think we need to talk about uh, restaurant integration. Yes, that sounds yes. Dining and dining and, and lodging as a brand extension for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, Jordan, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hey, cool. Thanks so much. This is awesome. See ya.